these high priestesses were giving people plant medicine as a sacrament to remember their own divine nature. And they got shut down and killed for it. Welcome to Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? I'm Emily Fletcher, and I believe that bliss is your birthright. That's why I'm calling on my world-class network to uncover the most potent, spine-tingling, even taboo healing modalities, all so you can reclaim your bliss. Let's do this. Sweet friends, welcome to a very special episode, which is the first in a four-part series of podcasts. So this summer, I went on a pilgrimage with my best friend, Layla, and it was a priestess pilgrimage to Eleusis, to Delphi, and to Crete, three beautiful, sacred, ancient sites in Greece. Now, why do we pick these three locations? Well, we both recently read a fascinating book called The Immortality Key. Now, The Immortality Key was written by Brian Moresco. Now, Brian is not a meditation teacher, hippie dippy, weirdo, sex witch. He's a classicist, he's a researcher, he's never done psychedelics before, and he has spent the last 10 years researching exactly what was happening at these ancient sacred sites. So, in Eleusis, there was something called the Eleusinian Mysteries, which was a festival that would happen about once a year, and you're only allowed to go once and you couldn't talk about what happened. If you shared what happened at Eleusis, it was punishable by death. But people have hypothesized, people have written books about it, people have been curious about exactly what was going on. We know it had something to do with Demeter and Persephone, which we talk about in the episode. But the interesting thing about Eleusis is that it's 45 minutes from Athens. And Athens at this time, where the festivals were happening, where the Eleusinian mysteries were taking place, was birthing Western civilization as we know it. Plato, Euripides, Aristotle, the people that birthed democracy and theater and much of, like I said, civilization as we know it in the West was born out of what some of the leaders and thinkers were experiencing in these ceremonies facilitated by priestesses. So you're going to learn all of this in the episodes, but Brian Moresco hypothesized and has now proven that actually much of what was happening were sacred fertility rituals, sacred sexual rituals, and that they were serving medicine, that they were serving a precursor to LSD called ergot and also some sort of a psilocybin mushroom mixture, all which can be proven by now we have the technology to get to actually analyze the molecules of the chalices that were being that the medicine was being served in. So we're going to go into much greater detail, but I wanted to give you a big picture framework of what this journey entails, because the implications of this are huge, because it means that the very institutions that have tried to control us, the very institutions that have tried to divorce us from our own divinity, the direct access to God found through our own bodies, through our own endogenous pharmacology, the direct access to divine, which we can find through medicine, through plant medicine, through the earth, the very organizations that have told us that this is bad or wrong or a sin was actually born out of these rituals. So this is a fascinating conversation with some very real time, very big implications. So here's how it's going to work. The first episode is being released on my podcast. Why isn't everyone doing this? The second one is coming out on Layla's show, which is called This Tantric Life. Number three will be on my show. And the number four, which is a doozy, is going to be on Layla's show, This Tantric Life. I will share with you right now that I uh, reveal new sides of me, new parts of me. This is a really um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say scary time, really vulnerable time because I'm opening up and showing sides of me that I've never really shared before. So thank you in advance for your kindness, for your compassion. And I'm so excited for you to go on this journey with us. So enjoy this very special episode of Why Isn't Everyone Doing This with Layla Martin. Hi. Hi. I love you so much. I love you so much. We've been on quite a ride. Yes, we have. We have been on quite a journey. So I would love to start with asking you like what inspired you to even create this high priestess pilgrimage for us? Mm. And can you define what a high priestess is? Mm. Yes. So what inspired me to create this pilgrimage is that as a little girl and a little white girl growing up in America, it wasn't just that God was a man, right? I grew up Catholic. You go to church on Sunday, God is a man, Jesus is a man. Holy Spirit, like spirit, but like probably, probably maybe a dude. I don't know, right? <laughs> maybe a dude. We're not going to talk about it. And women certainly are not spiritual leaders. All the people giving the sermons are men. All the people giving the sermons are men, right? But beyond that, 
right, even further. So, and what's interesting is like, you know, the Pope reaffirmed very recently, like women are not capable of holding spiritual transmission. This Pope? Yes, oh. in Christianity. We're reaffirming women have no place in leadership in the church, right? It still runs that deep, that if you have a pussy, you do not belong in spiritual leadership. But deeper than that, right, there was the stories of what a witch is, right? Uh, you know, a, a scary, like nose, like big nose, living in the forest alone, probably eating babies, stewing frogs. Lizards. Right? Yeah, maybe you dress up, ha ha ha, as one for Halloween, but like you don't want to be one. And deeper than that, right? those women got killed and burned. So even in high school, like, what did we learn? Like Salem witch burning, right? Or hanging of the witches. Like that's literally what you learn in high school is witches got killed, witches were burned. And the etymology of the word witch, it comes from wisdom and it comes from the old Indo-European word of being able to see. So mm. a witch is one who can see. A witch is one who is wise. And so when you look all the way through the history, why were the wise ones and eventually the wise women, but it was people of all genders, people who wanted to allow everyone in their community to directly know themselves as the divine, to have a direct relationship to divinity. Why were those people not only killed, but then in our very lifetimes, why were the stories we were told about them so scary, right? And even still to this day, right, it's becoming cool to do witchcraft again. And in fact, Gen Z is so excited. Witchcraft is like the top topic for teenage girls. And in our generations and older, it's still scary. And even for me, like I started studying spirituality 20 years ago, like Eastern spirituality, Tantra. And for the longest time, I was like, I would not be a witch. Witches are like messing with nature. They're doing, you know, spells. Like that's a joke. What I didn't realize was witches are the wise women in every fucking culture, regardless of what you want to call it, right? They're the medicine women, the shamans in the European tradition, the witches, right? And they exist globally of women in their spiritual power, in their sovereignty. And actually, I would argue that it's bigger than that because even saying like to be in your spiritual power, you have to be a priest. You have to go through the Christian church. You have to be celibate is a way of controlling men's spirituality and people of all genders. So this awakening started to make me feel like, okay, I am a witch and a high priestess. They are the same thing, right? A witch is kind of the lower word of what you call a high priestess to make her seem lower than she is. But I want us to reclaim both words. I want us, every single one of us, to reclaim our ability to caretake spirituality in our own lives and in our own bodies and to be a lighthouse for others to see that as well. Mm. And I think you can be a high priestess of any tradition. I think you can be a high priestess of the Christian tradition and we'll talk about what that looked like and how there were high priestesses of the Christian tradition. I think you can be a high priestess of your tantric tradition, of your religion with no name tradition, of your nature tradition, of your Buddhist tradition. And you can claim the word high priestess which to me is a female who creates ritual spaces for herself and others to taste the divine, to touch the divine, to know their own divine nature. That's what a high priestess is. And in the European tradition, which then spread all over, that woman became called a witch and she was killed for wanting to show others that not only were they God and they had a divine wisdom and a divine essence, but that they were empowered to hold sacred space for others to remember their own divine nature. Mm -hmm. And so this journey to me is to go back to these ancient sites and see that there was a time when women were in leadership, spiritual leadership. And this is really key in Eleusis, and we talk about this in our journey, the government protected them. Society protected them. They didn't go after them. They didn't kill them. They didn't threaten them. They didn't deny them their spiritual authority. They protected them. 
so that they could transmit spiritual wisdom to the people, to the masses, and how important that transmission was. So as we go and reconnect to our own spiritual sovereignty and power, the invitation on this journey is for all of us to reconnect to our spiritual sovereignty and power. And this journey to me, it's not just spirituality, it's your own spiritual connection to yourself, to your body, to your own divinity, changes the way you make love changes the way you fall in love, changes the way you eat food. And so this journey for us hasn't just been like, la -di -da -di -da, let's claim high priestess reality. It's been, how do I face sickness, right? You've been sick this entire trip. For me, it's been, how do I relate to the beauty of my own body and my struggle with that? How do we celebrate life without feeling guilty? How do we own lovemaking between us, our own expression of bisexuality and our expression of lovemaking in the world, our own arrows? So when we talk about this, it's not just this, ooh, let's like, you know, wear snakes and goddess dresses at some ancient Greek site. It's so real for you and I, and it's so real for everyone, how this reclamation of spiritual power changes every aspect of our being. Wow, thank you so much for articulating that so beautifully. And there's things I want to underscore and highlight. One, you said the religion that has no name. And this is a new term or concept for me. I never heard this before reading The Immortality Key. So I do want to just introduce The Immortality Key, which is a beautiful book by Brian Morescu. And it's an extraordinary journey of this man's like 10 year research pilgrimage on basically seeing what he could find to prove that one, women were serving medicine, what type of medicine they were serving. And now specifically at Eleusis, like you mentioned, it's not just about not having to hide who you are. It's not just about not having to hide being a wise woman. It's like, what would it feel like to have a whole infrastructure built around it and having the world leading politicians, the world leading philosophers, everyone who was anyone came to Eleusis to experience the Eleusinian mysteries. Yes. Now, why is that? Because they got to die before they died. They actually got to go through a portal and have a direct experience of the divine, which reminds us that we are a part of the one, right? We are some of the one, that we are a wave on the ocean. And we get to experience that viscerally, again, is so much more powerful than just sitting in a pew and having someone tell you what you should and should not do with your body, which is what most people's experience of doctrine and dogmatic religions are. Now, I want to just acknowledge that I know that many people have had direct experiences of God through Catholicism, through Christianity, through, you know, our more familiar doctrine and dogmatic religions. Yes, God is everywhere all the time. So I, this is not like, I don't want this to be like a witch hunt against Catholicism. It's just naming that actually God is everywhere and that any sort of campaign to make us forget that, it's time for that to be eradicated. And so when you named the religion that has no name, I would love to explore this a little bit more because I feel like we both got a direct transmission of that when we were in Eleusis. And by the way, we had the entire place to ourselves. You'll see in the footage, except for one security guard, which will become infamous. <laughs> um, but the religion that has no name to me feels like nature itself cosmic intelligence itself, divine wisdom itself, the very animating force inside of us, the thing that has been around forever and will be forever and cannot be owned by any gender, by any specific religion, by any organization. It is so much more vast than that. And just to give like a quick hypothesis, it's like, why would anyone want to make someone forget that? Well, that they're easier to control. And similarly with sexuality, like when, you, when you're practicing sacred sexuality and Tantra, which you've dedicated your whole life to helping people remember, that's one way that people can plug themselves into the divine. And also through this medicine work, you have this direct visceral experience of God. And when you remember that those things are available to you, you are much harder to control. You do become more sovereign. You do become more independent. And so it makes sense that this got, that we got divorced from it and yet it is time to reclaim it. So thank you so much for starting this 
journey. So let's just talk a little bit about Eleusis spe specifically. Like, I know it's right outside of Athens. It's um, like, what would, what did you know about it before we got here? And what did you learn while we were there? I think it would be really important for people to know a couple of keys from the immortality key yep. that are really world changing. Yeah. So number one, as you're talking about, Brian is a lawyer from Washington, DC, married. He's never done plant medicine. Researched this book for 10 years, went to all these sites, including Lucis that we just went to, to say that early Christianity, which is different from the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. was paleo Christianity, he calls it. Paleo Christianity mm -hmm. was likely a plant medicine sacrament delivered by women to everybody. So back in the Greek Empire, slaves, women, high earning men, whatever, you were welcome to take this sacrament, what became wine and bread, the blood and body of Christ, to remember that you yourself were divine. You unified, you became one with Christ, with the divine spirit, with the Holy Spirit, right? And so when we do talk about the Catholic Church in this episode, it's not that everything about the Catholic Church is wrong. It's not even that Christianity is wrong. It's that people who wanted to maintain power and the Catholic Church was the most powerful and still to this day is the largest private landholder in the world. It amassed a tremendous amount of real estate and wealth and power. And that created an incredible distortion and desire to make people who wanted access to God, who wanted access to healing, who wanted access to the Holy Spirit, believe what the Catholic Church wanted them to believe as part of the path to God. And that's where the toxicity comes in. Not that you can find Jesus in your life, not that you can touch the Holy Spirit, but that the Catholic Church came in and said, for you to access Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you have to agree that sex is dirty. You have to agree that your body is the domain of sin. And you have to agree that women are less than and don't deserve a voice in spirituality. And so that homosexuality. doctrine, homosexuality, right? This doctrine of original sin, that there is something implicitly wrong with you and you are always on the verge of veering into sin and something wrong and we are here to save you. We are going to keep you in line. That is the toxicity. And I grew up Catholic with that, right? I could feel the Holy Spirit in church. I could feel the beauty and magic of Jesus's teachings. And I got told that to continue to access that, I better not have sex until I got married, that there was something wrong and sinful about my body. And so what is so revolutionary about reclaiming these high priestess traditions and about the immortality key is this teaching that you can have God and your body is holy. You can have God and sexuality is beautiful. And in fact, the other piece of the immortality key that is so powerful is that these high priestesses were likely serving plant medicine, ergot from wheat, which is a natural form of LSD. And we also got told that plant medicine AKA drugs are bad, wrong, evil, frying your brain, stay the fuck away. Definitely not spiritual, right? And so what's so cool about the immortality key is he says these high priestesses were giving people plant medicine as a sacrament to remember their own divine nature. That drugs maybe aren't some scary bad thing that's gonna corrupt the masses, but actually psychedelics, plant medicine, LSD, mushrooms, right, that put you back in touch with your body, your heart, are not only good for you, help you see the truth, but maybe actually would put us back in touch with our bodies and the truth of the divine in a way that could heal the corruption and illness of society. This is so massive because, I mean, I grew up and I was born in 1979. I grew up through the 80s. I did skits in elementary school for D.A.R.E., which was the drug abuse resistance education program. I was like the director and star of our D.A.R.E. skits. I watched those commercials like, this is your brain. And they'd put an egg in a frying pan and they'd be like, this is your brain on drugs. And they would turn up the heat. And you just thought that your brain was getting scrambled if you ever did drugs. Now, obviously addiction is real. Yes, there are people that use drugs to 
numb their pain. Yes, all of those things exist. And if we get separated from our own divinity and we don't have anyone to hold space, we don't have anyone to help us move through those portals, we are not taught how to dance with this flavor of divinity, I think addiction is so much more likely to be a problem than if we were to actually see it as a path to the divine and not one that we have to necessarily tithe to the church or give our power away to someone else. One thing I want to highlight that I love from the immortality key is one they called mushrooms. I mean, for thousands of years, people have called mushrooms little saints, yeah. little teachers. Yeah. So we say mushrooms, we mean like psilocybin, the psychoactive um, mushrooms. Also, one thing I learned today is that in the recipe that these high priestesses were serving in Eleusis, when they would say what it was, it was like barley and malted this and water. And, and I thought it was interesting that like, why would they name water as an ingredient? Because it would, ended up being a code. And if you put all of those letters together, you spelled out micra, which is the word for mushroom. So it was like they were hiding the fact that what they were serving in these mystery ceremonies was mushrooms yes. or LSD or some brew of some sort. That People went to Eleusis to, to drink something, to take something and to see something. Yes. The Kaikion. And so what's so magical about Eleusis, right? It's a 45 minute drive from Athens and you would take a pilgrimage there maybe once in a lifetime. A couple of people came back and could do it, but back in the day, that was a huge deal. Yeah. And Eleusis welcomed anyone who could speak Greek. So at the time that was radical because you could come if you were a slave in the Greek empire, as long as you spoke Greek, you could come if you were a woman, you could come if you were lower class, you could come if you were upper class and everyone came. So from, you know, senators or from political leaders, right? And the uh, rulers of the Greek empire, the leaders of the Greek armies to everyday common people mm -hmm. to slaves came and they saw life at Eleusis. And it was said that you hadn't lived unless you had been to Eleusis. Yes. And something to understand about the function of Eleusis. So it was an old agrarian cult, right? It goes back thousands of years and really was, you know, building and building and building in power and influence around the time of the glory days of Athens, the glory days of the Greek empire and the empire and the nation states. And what it did was it showed people that instead of this story that death was the end and that you went down into the river Styx as a kind of ghost-like soul in Hades, it was What's showing river them Styx? the river Styx is where souls in the kind of mythology of Greece, it's where you ended up after death. And it was like this gloomy, dreary place. Okay. And so what people said who went to Eleusis and one of the main agreements you made when you came to Eleusis, which you would not speak about what happened. And so that's why we can't tell you exactly what happened, although I made a pretty good guess when we were there. So people would go on pilgrimage here and they would walk from the cave of Pluto, AKA Hades, the ruler of the underworld. And they would do this walk all the way up to the Telestrion, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. And this was where the Holy of Holies was up the hill. And it's actually like a cave of sorts, like it's a hole in the ground. We saw it. So the Holy of Holies, but why, do you know why it was called the Holy of Holies? The Holy of Holies is usually where you had the statue or uh, some sort of embodiment of the divine. And it was where the most sacred experience or sacred object was held in a temple. Okay. And so they would enact this theater right but in greece the theater was you as the audience weren't just watching you were alive so the word catharsis to experience emotional release and healing actually came from greek theater so as you were watching the enactment you were in it yourself you were crying you were purging you were in the darkness yourself and so in eleusis you would go on this pilgrimage you would get to the Telestrion, the main temple, you would be served a drink, likely plant medicine of some sort, so mushrooms or LSD. And what would happen is that people, and we tasted this when we were there, they would wake up 
to the truth of their being. And oh my God, maybe death isn't this horrible portal where I end up in this like putrid river of misery for all time, but maybe death is a continuation of my consciousness, which is aligned with everlasting life. They would use that phrase, everlasting life, die before you die and no everlasting life. And so they would wake up to this idea that maybe life isn't this dreary experience and death is the end, but you have this divine magnificence within you. And one of the things that Brian says that's so important and so powerful to me is the Greeks, right? And one of the reasons we look to the Greeks with such awe is because they created democracy, science as we know it, philosophy as so many of us know it. Now, this was innovated in many cultures and Greece was this hot spot of creativity, of development of the high arts, right? Some of the most incredible plays ever written, some of the most incredible uh, sculpture, right? And this idea of democracy, what if we rule ourselves by common desire and come together rather than just one king lording over everyone else? What if we start sharing leadership? And what Brian says is these people didn't believe in fairy tales like we've been led to believe with like Zeus and Achilles and all of that. They actually were doing plant medicine in touch with oneness, with the deep nature of their being. They were practicing mystical rites and these people gave birth to some of the most powerful tenets and foundations of society that we still celebrate today. Which is such a fascinating point because the fear, I think I even said it to you the other day, like the fear is like if, if everyone starts doing drugs, yeah. well, society will just fall apart. Everyone yeah. would be anarchists yeah. and we would be murdering everyone or stealing everything. And, and actually we have historical proof to suggest the exact opposite is true. That when people have their own way to see and experience the divinity of their own individuality, that entire new civilizations are birthed. Yeah. I want to also just legitimize for anyone that might be freaking out about psychedelics or drugs that, you know, there is a psychedelic you know, renaissance happening right now. And there's been a lot of funding happening at Johns Hopkins. There's a lot of universities that are really putting millions of dollars into studying the effects of this and the healing effects of this. And one thing I thought was fascinating that Brian mentions in the immortality key is that of the people who have done, um, I think psilocybin, it was mushrooms, 73% of them said it was the single most significant experience of their entire life, mm. more than their marriage, more than the birth of their child. 73% of them said it was the most significant experience of their entire lives. So this pilgrimage is not like, it's not a fairy tale. It is an initiation. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it's important to note that thousands of people would come for thousands of years, specifically, I think it's September in the harvest time. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to explore a little bit about the, not the fairy tales, but the characters around the cave. So mm -hmm. we have Persephone, we have mm -hmm. Hades, who you mentioned, mm -hmm. we have Demeter, mm -hmm. like these, these deities that represented what Eleusis was all about. Can yeah. you share a little bit about that? Absolutely. So uh, also I'd, I'd love to, like, as I tell this story, I'd love to plant us in Eleusis, right? So you yeah. and I journey to Eleusis. Yeah. Um, when you get to Eleusis, as you said, we were the only ones there basically, except for security. We should give them a name. What do we think our security herd's name was? <laughs> I just thought of them as the patriarchy, but <laughs> <laughs> teeny tiny patriarch. <laughs> we'll call it. We'll call him Pat. So you get to Eleusis, and there's Pluto's cave right there at the very beginning. There's all these ruins, but Pluto's cave is right there at the beginning before you begin the ascent to the temple up on the hill. And maybe we should have waited to take the mushrooms until we got up the hill, which maybe was what the people did. But we took it in the the cave of Pluto. Yes. It was right on time for me. And Emily is fucking hilarious on mushrooms. Like, like so hilarious. I drank a lot of water in the car. So we're in the cave of Pluto and Emily just doesn't stop saying the funniest things ever. So we're there and I'm like, you know, being a good student, like I have like my spine straight, I'm meditating. I've also spotted the Greek guard who is sitting there checking his watch, looking at stuff, but he's like actually watching us. Emily hasn't noticed him yet. 
I think he's just a patron. I was yeah. like, oh, there's one other person here. Look at him reading the sign. I don't know he was a security guard. Emily's like leaned back on the like rocks of the cave of Pluto. Like she's like in it. We like open our eyes and Emily goes, it is wild with your eyes closed and it is wild with your eyes open. And I was like, yeah, that's so true about everything about life. And then I was like, oh God, she's making me laugh and I have to pee. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to ruin the journey. Like for those of you who have ever taken any kind of plant medicine mushrooms, you know, you're like, hi. And you're like, wow, the bathroom feels really far away right now. It's a whole, it's a whole pilgrimage of itself to go to the porta potties. It's really far. So I was like, I can do this. I can hold my pee. I'm a grown ass woman. I do freaking crystal egg practices. I have strengthened my pelvic floor. I can handle this. So then we, you know, close our eyes again. We're in the cave of Pluto. I'll tell you more about Pluto in just a second. Emily opens her eyes and goes, they sure do make death sexy. <laughs> so I start losing it again, right? Oh my God. So then finally, Emily's like, do you really want to go to the bathroom? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so we take a pilgrimage to the bathroom, which are these fantastic porta potties, like really? so clean. The world's so greatest clean. porta potties. And Emily will not stop making me laugh, even as we're getting almost to the porta potty. And I don't think she realizes how on the edge I am of peeing myself. She keeps making me laugh. And I was like, Emily, stop. So I start running towards the porta potty. I literally pee on myself <laughs> before we start the journey to Eleusis. But what was so magical and what I think is so important about that moment is that that could have ruined anyone's trip. I literally peed on my high priestess dress. You can see I'm wearing this glorious blue dress, these magical wings on my body, and I peed myself. I had to rinse not only my dress in the bathroom um, sink, but I literally peed on the floor and I was like, I'm not gonna let some Greek person clean up my pee. I peed on the floor, I'm gonna do this. I'm like, here I am high as balls, freaking washing the porta potty floor at Eleusis before we've even started the ascent. <laughs> this is so perfect because in a lot of cultures, one day you are the spiritual teacher, you're the spiritual leader, and the next day you're doing the dishes. Totally. So I love that we were like fully reclaiming full high priestess codes and you started it by just wiping your own urine off of the floor of the porta potty. Starting here at the cave of Pluto. So in the myth, right, Persephone gets abducted by Pluto, aka Hades, and taken to the underworld. And while she's away, her mother Demeter, scours the earth searching for her and creates winter time, freezes everything over until her daughter's returned. Her daughter is returned, but she ate pomegranate seeds, which were the forerunner of the apple seed in a lot of the mythology, mm -hmm. which is basically to eat the fruit of knowledge. And so when she comes up, basically because she ate something in the underworld, she has to always return to the underworld seasonally. And so Demeter turns the season. So it's spring, summer, and then all of a sudden you get fall and winter. But what this myth has meant to me and what I really feel in it and others have seen in it is that this descent to the underworld is part of coming into your wholeness and power. So as long as you're avoiding the underworld, the meeting of death, the meeting of your own traumas, right? Until you go deep into the darkness of your own nervous system, you won't actually experience the fullness and wholeness of life. Mm. So prior to that, there were no seasons, there was no shift, right? And when she went into the underworld, Demeter freezes the world over, like what happens in trauma. Nothing grows, nothing thrives. As soon as her daughter is returned, she brings springtime and summer back, fecundity, abundance. And though the, the thing though is that Persephone never forgets. She ate this wisdom of the underworld. She ate this wisdom of the darkness of the shadow realms and she remains queen of the underworld. And so one of the greatest initiates of power, right? And so she has so much to teach us about this courage to do the real work to know ourselves. So I wanna just share a little bit about my internal experience yeah. of the cave because it felt like, and I don't know if reading the book or if knowing that it was the cave of Pluto or understanding that Persephone would go into the underworld with Hades for part of the year before she'd be reunited with her mother, Demeter, mm -hmm. if that colored my experience or if this would have been the transmission anyway. But we, we got to the cave, we sat in meditation, we did a prayer, we did an invocation over these beautiful mushroom chocolates. 
So if you've never done them, it's just, it's um, actual mushrooms and the active ingredient is psilocybin. So that becomes dried and powdered and you can make it into chocolate or, or any other another number of substances. So we offered a prayer. We ate about three quarters of a mushroom. So it was probably maybe like 0.75 of a gram. Yeah. And again, I'm not advertising that anyone else do this. This is not medical advice. I'm just sharing what we did on this journey. And we took them and then pretty quickly thereafter, it was like, oh, here we go. Well, here's here's a little classic Emily Fletcher for everyone. I was like, I, I think we took too much. And Emily looks at me and goes, we did come here to get high, Layla. <laughs> we literally came here to trip. <laughs> we literally came here to take mushrooms. Like, what do you want to not be high? And I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> Which helps you to surrender into the experience. Totally. Right? Sometimes we just just the, the smallest little reminder can help us to surrender into the fullness of the experience, yeah. which is what the high priestesses were doing anyway there. Yes. So eventually, you know, we close our eyes, we're meditating, I go into full lounging goddess mode. And the sacred geometry that I started seeing, the, the most beautiful fractals of artistry and the repeating patterns in nature. So if everyone, anyone's ever looked at a Romanesco, uh, which is like what I call cauliflower on LSD, or if you've seen a snowflake, like these beautiful sacred geometric patterns occur in nature all the time. And sacred geometry I've heard recently called the language of God. Mm -hmm. And almost everyone sees some version of it if they take psychedelics. It could be on a pattern on a wall, or they might see repeating versions of them. And this sacred geometry has been around for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. They're called yantras in the Vedas. You know, we have mantras, which are the sound version of something that helps us to reconnect to God. Mm -hmm. But a yantra is a visual version of something that helps us reconnect to God. Mm -hmm. And when you take these little saints, when you take these little teachers, you close your eyes and you see a visual representation of the religion that has no name. You get to see and experience this thing that is so much bigger and vaster and more beautiful than any one religion, than any one dogma, than any one person, than even this one lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so as we're in the cave, I did feel like I had a visceral experience, not necessarily of facing death, but of reuniting with that which cannot be named. Mm. and really being in such awe of the outrageous beauty of it. Mm. And that's why I said the first thing I said once we opened our eyes is like, it's amazing with your eyes closed and it's amazing with your eyes open. And, and it's a simple phrase, but there's a lot inside of it because to me it meant it's going to be amazing after this life. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing in this life with my eyes are open and I can celebrate everything that's happening on the 3D magic that the mushrooms were allowing me to see not a distortion of reality, but perhaps what's actually real. Yeah. There's so much that we cannot perceive with our human senses. And yet when you have this medicine that connects you to something beyond the human intelligence, you can start to see a tree for what it actually is. Mm. You could, we were seeing constellations and galaxies inside of this ancient stones. Yeah. We were seeing the energy between us. And so it, it genuinely did make me less afraid of dying because if death is anything close to that, yeah. then I will celebrate it with open arms. Mm. And that really did give me a level of sovereignty in this life mm. to live fully because I do not feel as afraid of death. And the image that I kept coming back to was that of like the, the lounging Buddha or like you always see these religious figures like half eyes open, half eyes closed. And it felt like for me, that was the transmission for me to bring back of how can we be yes in this world and awake and simultaneously remember the beauty of the unmanifest. And why are we so scared of death, right? Like maybe it is this incredible transition to something even more amazing. Yeah. What if it's even better? Yeah. And like in like Osho tradition, you celebrate when someone dies, like they've transitioned, but we spend all this time being so afraid of it and locking it away and not wanting to face it. Whereas like, hey, what if it exactly as you said, was even more amazing, right? Or, and B, what if we were able to celebrate the beauty of death as a teacher and to change the way that we die in such a potent way? And right there was this deep transmission of elusis right at the very beginning yeah. of death not being this terrifying horrible thing that you have to wear like terror 
or like a chain around your neck. Or pretend like it's not coming for all of us. Yeah. What if you faced it head on or like, wow. Which is why I think they said you haven't really lived until you've gone to Eleusis because you go to Eleusis to die before you die. And we did that right out of the gate in the cave. Is there anything you want to share about your cave experience or should we start to take people up our pilgrimage? Just take people up. Okay. And so we emerged out of the cave. We started to go up the steps. Oh, and then before we go to the Holy of Holies, there's this little, it looks almost like a tiny amphitheater. And you know, I love a stage. You can take the girl out of Broadway. You cannot take the Broadway out of the girl. So I get up on this and I said, hey, Layla, would you mind taking a photo of me? Like I, I felt like I wanted to capture this. Yeah. So I get up on this stage and I start just feeling the Holy Spirit. Like I am moving. I am letting the goddess move through me. Layla's taking photos. It gets pretty activated, but I'm just standing still You're dancing. not on a sacred site. You're nope, not, not on roped anything off. roped off. Nope, you're just literally some stairs and open area. Totally allowed to be there yep. at one moment, taking the photos, fine. I start dancing. It gets pretty activated. Things get pretty heated. And literally the moment that it starts to really like, you can feel that kundalini energy rising in my body. We hear our friend Pat, the security guard, He's blowing his whistle like very aggressively. And without even, not even for a moment, did I start to feel shame or embarrassed. I wasn't mad. I didn't stop. I actually celebrated it like, yes, I got a whistle. It was so hot. It was so activated that this sweet, tiny man is trying to tell me to stop with his little whistle. Yeah. And it, it just felt almost laughable. Yeah that he was trying to control the bigness of what was flowing through me. And it felt like a tiny microcosm of what has been happening for thousands of years. You get too close to God, you get too sovereign, you get too activated. We are going to try and stamp that out. We're going to blow our whistle and we're going to try and make you small. Yeah. And I was really, I didn't even notice it in the, in the moment. Like I just started laughing and kept dancing, but I really appreciated you reflecting that back to me afterwards where you said, you know, you, you just celebrated that you got the whistle. Like I got a 10 out of 10 on the hotness scale. So much. You owned it so hard. It was so shameless. And like, this is the power of sisterhood and us doing our practices, being in the high priestess transmission. He blew the whistle and I was like, girl, you deserve 400 whistles for that. You know, like, and just owning it. And one of the things you carried so powerfully in that journey was us never going against him. Like we didn't make this like, oh, now like, fuck you. Like we're going to like, try, like, you know, whatever. It was just like you held this beautiful transmission of let's be in our pleasure. Let's be in our power. Let's own this. Why would this be an affront to anyone? It's a gift. We don't have to make it us versus him. But what if we make it about what we're doing is beautiful? We keep owning that. And I really felt that in the power, not to keep talking about peeing on myself, but you know, it's whatever, it's it's part of the journey. I, when I peed myself, you went into the bathroom next to me and you were like, here if you need me, totally here for support, totally here for conversation. And it sounds so simple, but the ability to be more shameless with your body, with life, with challenges, with getting a whistle blown at you, with having a, a biological malfunction, it allows you to keep going in a way where you get to own your beauty and your power and your magnificence and your love in a bigger way, right? Because this shame is wrapped in all of our nervous systems around like, maybe my body's going to do something that people will judge me for. Maybe I'm going to be so sexy that some random man's going to get offended, you know? And like, we were able to just ride through it. And that shamelessness to me, is the power of the high priestess transmission. Mm, yes, and sisterhood and yeah. friendship and trust. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Okay, so then we make it up after our, our little our little whistle blowing is sidetracked. We then enter this main sacred site, this temple, this Holy of Holies. And for a moment we separated and you went to the Holy of Holies and I felt drawn to, it was almost like stadium seating, not, not surprising that I wanted to go to the stadium. <laughs> And, and also of note that there was an actual stadium-esque temple built around these priestesses, this medicine, this magic, these ceremonies. Yeah. It's a big deal. It felt very validating to me that the fact that I want to bring this stuff to a stadium is not just about my ego. It's not just about, it's not an affront. It's not an F you to anyone. Yeah. It's a, what if we actually got 
a critical mass of people and made an antenna this big that we could start to transmit this out into the species. So you go to the Holy of Holies. I am drawn to this stadium thing. And as we look up, you know, it's it's ruins. So you can see the skeleton of what was, and it's quite well preserved actually. But there's also like, you know, there's cracks in the stone. And there was this one beautiful giant crevice. And, and the color of the stone was this um, red color. And it looked almost like female genitalia. It looked almost like a giant eight foot high hoo-ha. And, and down the stadium stairs was this same red color. So it almost looked like this beautiful, radiant, bleeding pussy. And I felt so drawn to it that I just went and I kept looking at it and I sat down in front of it. And yes, we're on mushrooms. And so if you've never done them, it's almost like you're seeing life through 5D, through technicolor. Like everything gets more beautiful. It's not like you see like little space aliens. It's not like, for me anyway, something that is, does not exist just shows up. Hallucination, I think, is a little scary of a word because people think like, oh, this egg is going to start talking to me or... Um, you know, that like suddenly there's clowns coming through that aren't actually there. But in my experience, psychedelics do not make you see things that are not there. They allow you to see things as they are. So it's like the place came alive once we had these little teachers inside of us working with our nervous systems. And so it felt very important, the transmission between this giant hoo-ha and mine. And so I just sat in front of it and I I opened myself to her because it, it felt like there was some sort of a transmission that wanted to happen. And as I was there, I was looking at the beautiful clouds covering the sun, and it felt like Father Sky and Mother Earth in such a clear polarity and representation. And so I just wanted to absorb that polarity of Father Sky and Mother Earth of this religion that has no name. And even though these were ruins about something that was built and that this thing had been destroyed, the actual thing that that the religion that had no name was serving is still alive and well. The fractals of the cacti that were growing through the cement, the beauty of the flowers and the trees that were growing up out of the plastic from the excavation sites. It's like, oh, it doesn't matter really what humans are honoring or not. This life force is going to happen no matter what. This creativity will keep on creating. What happened for you in the Holy of Holies? Or what was it like to just you as a woman who's been serving as a high priestess for so many decades, what was it like to enter that space for the first time? Well, Pat kept me out of the Holy of Holies, so that was a very... (laughs) He didn't blow a whistle at me, but he was like... So you got let in farther than I was, so I kind of was trying to get in, got kicked out, so then I came and joined you on the steps. And as I dropped in on the steps, I just felt like they were inviting people to know the truth. That was it. They wanted people to know the truth. I have a divine, eternal nature, and it is sacred and beautiful and whole. And to get there, I have to face fear and trauma and death and all the hardship of this life in a very real way, not even an esoteric way. I have to descend to my own underworld, face my shadows, face my fears, face who and what I am. And when I do that, I can take, you know, Persephone eats the pomegranate seeds from the underworld. I can take the wisdom of the underworld and ascend into the ecstasy of being. And I just sat there and I was like, they were showing people the truth of their own divine nature. And they got shut down and killed for it. And Europe forgot. And the Catholic Church had an agenda for people to be terrified of anything that would remind them of their own divinity outside of the teachings, the very strict teachings of the Catholic Church, not Christianity, that we are all sacred, that we can touch the Holy Spirit, that we can be inspired by a story of death and rebirth that is ours, right? But this rigid, if you want to be spiritual, if you want to go to heaven, you better do this. And one of the things that I find so heartbreaking is 
is the mission work that then with colonialism, that it wasn't enough to just take it away in Europe. It then spread to Africa, to Central America, to Asia, where one, one group, one organization is going to another land and not only sharing, not generously sharing the teachings of like, hey, here's another way to God. If you like this one better, cool. Yeah. No, it was kidnapping children, brainwashing people, and then robbing people of their own ceremony and their own plant medicine that was helping them to get to God. Specifically with Native Americans, it was the peyote was the thing that was really um, extricated because they said that is what makes it harder, harder to convert. They won't convert to Catholicism if they keep the peyote. And how many different lineages, how many different indigenous cultures had their versions, their ver whatever was local to that community, the herbs, the plants, the flowers that allowed them to have that visceral experience and to have that not only taken away, but then criminalized and that you're then taught to fear that. Like you said the other day, you're like, you don't have to burn witches anymore. You just teach them to hate themselves. Yeah. It's like, you don't have to take away drugs anymore. You just teach everyone to be afraid of them. Yeah. And so it, I'm so delighted that science is catching up, that now we have irrefutable evidence that actually the healing power of psychedelics for addiction, for PTSD, that the government now is actually funding it to help with veterans who have PTSD, that you know, like we said, 73% of people who are doing this research at John Hopkins said that one singular experience is the most profound experience of their lives and oftentimes helps them to get off of other substances that they were abusing to numb the pain of life. So this feels like a big deal. I would love to hear your take on the similarities between this psychedelic revolution that is happening and what I feel like we're on the precipice of, which is a sexual revolution. Mm. So in my experience, when the Catholic Church went on this vendetta to silence high priestesses, all other religions, pagan traditions, and goddess worship, they also systematically, whether this was super thought through or just happened, I'm not sure, they made all practices that are more direct routes to divine remembrance bad, demonic, scary, you have a major problem, you're gonna get killed or burned at the stake or tortured. And these are practices like breathwork, meditation, yoga, plant medicine, sacred sexuality practices, right? If you have deep sex, if you breathe hard and deep and long enough, if you do conscious movement practices, if you meditate for long enough, you are going to activate your energy body. Your energy body, which is worshipped as a goddess in these traditions, it's definitely worshipped in the tantric tradition as Kundalini Ma, right? Shakti power. It reminds you of your sacred nature. You become magical. Magic to me is a word for being in touch with your own energy and the energy of all of nature. And so every practice that is a shortcut to activating your energy, remembering your own magic and having direct union with God, right? We know sex brings us to God. Oh God, oh God, oh God, right? We know orgasm brings us to oneness. All of those practices became wrong and bad and criminalized, right? You use the word criminalized. It's a small thing, oh boohoo Layla, but it goes to the heart of what happened. During that whole time, I'm banned on Meta. My Instagram account is shut down. Yeah, last week, you were removed from the internet. I was removed from the internet. I've had my account shut down on YouTube, right? I'm getting treated like a criminal. I got shut down for sexual solicitation. And they said a right-wing group kept reporting my account. And all I'm doing is showing people the sacredness of their own bodies, the beauty of their own arrows. And our account is set to 18 and older. I am talking to adults and I am getting shut down, right? That is the legacy of our society, like our technology companies, our government, our police systems. They're still set to criminalize people's spiritual remembrance and the tools that they use to remember themselves as God. Not religion, but mystical remembrance is still criminalized in our society. And we are just starting to normalize it. Meditation and yoga came first. 
plant medicine is following. And I believe that sacred sexuality, the beauty of our lovemaking and the divine power of it is next. And that as this becomes activated and we remember, so society will change back to a space where people are super creative, super attuned, super honoring of nature, and also highly innovative the way the Greek empire was, the way indigenous societies are, there's such a magic to it. And it's right that white people got their ancient traditions broken long ass time ago. And then we went and destroyed so many other people's traditions, but we're left with this broken pain that so many white people don't even realize of having our indigenous roots destroyed on pain and threat of death. And sometimes by actually being killed. And so we can act like hungry ghosts for other people's traditions rather than being deeply, deeply reverential to the power of those traditions and deeply honoring. And my experience, sometimes that comes from the fact that we have this original wound that most white people don't even recognize because we were taught to fear our own traditions. We still don't even know fully how to interact with other people's. Mm. Thank you for articulating that so beautifully. I remember when we were hanging out with our friend Aubrey and we were talking about this of like, you know, well, white people serving plant medicine and appropriation. And and when you pull the lens back far enough, it's like, we've all forgotten. Yeah, We've all forgotten. It's just how many generations back did you forget? And it feels like we've forgotten a long time ago. And so then we get afraid of other people that have more recent connections to the earth through to the divine. And so thank you for naming that. And amen to everything you said. Like, And so it is that we get to, as a society, with the power of internet and podcasts and technology, help people to remember that they are actually God pretending to be human. One thing that I, I do want to share, because just this morning as we were preparing for this podcast and, you know, I'll, we spent many hours like in front of this beautiful bleeding hoo-ha, just like receiving the transmission in full reveling of the beauty of it. And then today I was listening to, I put into Spotify, I was like, oh, maybe there'll be like some Eleusinian music to get us in the mood. And the first thing that came up was the Eleusinian Mysteries. And it was a lecture by Terence McKenna, who's like, you know, very famous psychedelic advocate and, um, you know, really helped so many people to understand. He was like one of the OGs in the psychedelic revolution. Mm-hmm. He's talking about Eleusis and he said that in the, Vict- in the Victorian age, the 14th century, people started getting really obsessed with like what was happening? Why were all of the great leaders and philosophers going there? What was the mystery? Mm-hmm. And eventually they said that they came to, it was actually just a giant like laser light show of a giant pussy. <laughs> And then Terence McKenna, through his POV, was like, certainly the entirety of our Western civilization was not built on top of a peep show, Mm -hmm. which he was sort of diminishing that. But actually, I thought it was fascinating that the Victorian researchers basically came to the same thing that was very much a part of our direct experience. Pussy worship. Yes, worshiping the matrix point of creativity itself, the portal through which every single human being on the planet comes through, and yet we've somehow turned it into the biggest insult in our language. And thank you, shout out to Regina Thomashauer, our dear friend, my roommate, who has just for decades helped to reclaim that word. And and so one, like who knows what was actually happening? It does seem pretty proven that they were serving something in sacred cups, that they were seeing something, some version of death, some version of the divine, and then reclaiming their divinity for themselves. Is there anything else you feel that you want to share about our experience or about this before we start to wrap it up? Just that I feel like the transmission of Eleusis and why it's so important Mm -hmm. is we all have magic. Mm -hmm. We all have energy and we all have spiritual wisdom. And no matter what tradition you feel called to, what tradition your ancestry is linked to, what practices speak to the poetry of your soul such that you want to be part of them, that activation of oneness and spiritual truth is universal and you can do it in a way that feels true to you. No one has to tell you that you have a right to access God if only you do X, Y, and Z. You have a right to access God, period. You, you are God already. You are a wave on the ocean and anything that helps us to remember that 
anything that helps us to embody that, to heal the shame and trauma that has allowed us to forget, like let's celebrate that. Let's not claim it for one culture or another. Let's not shame people for doing it. Let's do it in a way that is safe and healthy and honoring of all of our lineages that we've all managed to forget. Yeah. And all of us owning just a little bit more audacity, you know, we still encountered control at Eleusis that felt uncomfortable. And you and I are privileged in our stances in life by virtue of being white, by virtue of so many benefits that we have, by virtue of these successful companies we've built. And it's still hard for us to move forward so that all of society can be more free. And so that all this next generation can be more free in their reclamation of power. And so I also hope that people claiming more of this magic for themselves can take on some of that shamelessness, Mm -hmm. that you can own more of what does it mean and look like to be shameless in your life Mm -hmm. with your body so that you could get a thousand whistles and keep dancing and posing and being outrageous anyways, because we've become so afraid of that whistle and right now, all it is is a whistle. And I said when we were at Eleusis, because he got tired and went home eventually, and I was like, maybe instead of a fight, all you got to do is just outlast them. Yeah, just be willing to play the staying game. <laughs> and just one final point that I think is important is, you know, I think I'm a newer witch. Uh, like both on the 3D, this stuff is new to me. So I'm enjoying being a bridge between the worlds and making this stuff hopefully more attractive and accessible to mainstream audience. But I also think on the 5D, like of my lifetimes, I think I'm a newer witch. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't seem to carry the like depth of the transmission of the witch wound, which yeah. we spent some time talking about the difference between allowing the pleasure, the activations, the remembering to be an invitation and allowing bigger circles in versus it being an assumptive affront or some sort of a um, F you. And sort of the difference of that, that if you in your body or if in your recent lifetimes, you have a, a visceral memory of being burned at the stake, of course, you're not going to be like, hey, everybody, come on in. Like there's such fear of that, that you would need caves, you would need protection in order to be in your full magic if you have a visceral memory. And just, I know we say that term burned at the stake, burned at the stake, it's become almost like it's lost its power, but we're talking tens of thousands of women alive, trapped in public and lit on fire. So just to put yourself, just as a compassionate human being, to put yourself inside of another human being's shoes, that the fact that that even happened at all is such an outrageous atrocity, but then the fact that it was watched like sports, it just, it gives me goosebumps of of disgust because it was then we're saying, hey, we're doing it to this person, and if you get too audacious, if you get too magical, we'll do it to you too. Yeah. And so... This is the time, if enough of us remember all at the same time, they can't burn all of us, right? They can't burn all of us. And we outlasted them. Yeah, we're going to outlast <laughs> them. That's right. Oh, well, Leila, I love you so, so much. I am so grateful to you for your many years of living in your magic, for how many tens of thousands of women you have activated and brought into their magic. Um, I want to let everyone know well, what, two things. One, Layla and I, this is just day one of our journey. The next day or the day after, we went on a whole other pilgrimage. We went to Delphi, which is where the oracles of Delphi would prophesize to, again, like world leaders would come to Delphi to hear these high priestesses channel direct wisdom. And we went into Pan's cave. And you are definitely going to want to hear both of those stories. So I highly recommend that you go to This Tantric Life, which is Layla's amazing new podcast, where we will be talking about adventure number two. And trust me, you do not want to miss these stories. And I also want to let people know that I am currently in the Vita Coaching Certification. So I am a busy lady. I am running a seven-figure business. I have a five-year-old son. I have a long-distance lover. I don't have a lot of extra time. And yet I am dedicating my most valuable resource, which is my time, 
to studying these beautiful ancient practices with you because they do internally very much the same thing that the psychedelics help us to do externally. Like one is endogenous magic chemistry and the other one is exogenous magical chemistry. So thank you for creating this coaching. Thank you for taking me on as a student. Um, and it truly is, it's been so healing for me. Mm. And you know, people think, oh, it's like just fun and games. And yes, there is a lot of like bliss and ecstasy and fun and magic and play but it's also a deeply profound healing journey. I have really reclaimed some, some unintegrated parts of myself and some traumatized parts of myself that I didn't even know were there. Mm. And so I just wanna really, um, anyone who might want to step into their full magic, into their full wise woman, AKA witch, into their full high priestess, Vita coaching is a beautiful path to that. Um, so you can find This Tantric Life everywhere podcasts are. And Vita coaching is at laylamartin.com, yes? Yeah, and you can include a link in the show notes as well. Yep, we'll put the link to yeah. both in the show notes. Yeah, it teaches you a tantric approach to sex, love, and relationships, and it's a one-year professional certification. Yeah, and at the end, you are a sex, love, and relationship coach, which is a big deal. People don't know how to have sex right now. People don't know how to really love, and people certainly don't really know how to be in good, sacred relationships. So Leila, I love you. I'm so excited for part two. Yo! All right. I love you guys. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this, please like it. Tag us on Instagram. She is at the Layla Martin. I'm at Ziva Meditation. If you rate this, if you review it, it always helps to get this magic into the hands of the people who need it. And if you want to screenshot it and post it on Instagram and tag us even better, 